old Creflo Dollar preaching at Jamal Bryant's church, and it got bad. Gift! And he is a father in the new agreement, and in the old agreement, you serve him, but in the new agreement, he serves you. But let's talk about it here on All Things Theology. Cue my theme music. All Things Theology, All Things Theology, we chop it up properly without an apology. Gotta get that theology to God, hollow because this is how we do it at All Things Theology. Yo, grace and peace. Welcome back to another episode of All Things Theology, where this is your host, K-Dub. And today, you know we gotta talk about it. We gotta talk about Creflo Dollar at Jamal Bryant's church. Now, let me just say this. A sure way of, you know, saying you're a bad teacher, although we have years of evidence with Creflo Dollar, is partnering together with Jamal Bryant. Literally the worst of the worst. Boy, ain't no way, boy. Boy, ain't no way, boy. I'm tired of your church. Well, he preached a service. I think it was like a Friday evening service, and it was it was bad. Um, a lot of stuff I could just pick out. I'm going to highlight a few things just to demonstrate for you. Let's get at this first clip here. It is of utter importance that we rightly interpret the word of God regarding what speaks of the old covenant or agreement and what speaks of the new covenant or agreement. Because what was true under the old agreement may not be true under the new agreement. There might be something in the old agreement that is not valid in the new agreement. For example, in the old agreement, God was a judge. The wages of sin was death in the old agreement. But you can't come over in the new agreement because in the new agreement, you have a gift. And he is a father in the new agreement. And in the old agreement, you serve him. But in the new agreement, he serves you. No, 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 no. What? Bro, what are you talking How about? How dare man? you? That was a mouthful, but I wanted to play that all just to show you what we're going to do is go halfway through that and respond to some of the lunacy that was said here. Old agreement that is not valid in the new agreement. So let me just say this off the rip just to defend him before I criticize him. And that is true. There are some things that are true in the old covenant that are not no longer the case in the new covenant. I mean, one of the primary things you may be thinking of is sacrifice, right? <laughs> we don't make animal sacri sacrifices in the new covenant. Why? Uh, those were shadows to point to the reality of Jesus Christ. Read the book of Hebrews, correct? And so there is a true statement when it comes to ultimately what he's talking about is continuity, that which relates from old covenant to the new covenant. You know, I mean, it's wrong to murder in the old covenant it is wrong in the new covenant to murder right and then there is a discontinuity you know just things that aren't that do not carry over like i talked about with sacrifice uh would be a great study to dive into some of those things but hopefully that was just a good to whet your appetite but everything he said was is it it's Everything he said didn't actually relate to it. So so let's go point by point. Let's prove prove this biblically. For example, in the old agreement, God was a judge. The wages of sin was death in the old agreement. But you can't come over in the new agreement because in the new agreement, you have a gift. Let me. So he said in the new covenant, right in the old, God was a judge indicating that's not the longer the case in the new covenant well i mean is he is he literally arguing god is no longer a judge like he that attribute of him disappears he if what creflo dollar is saying is true it's actually very dangerous because that means god is changing right that would mean god changes i mean he will he literally lost an attribute being a judge um just a verse that speaks of god being a judge uh Second Timothy four, eight, it says in the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge. I don't know. Paul, Paul didn't Paul didn't get the memo from Creflo. The righteous judge will award to me on that day and not only to me, but also though all those who love his appearing. Maybe Paul, maybe Paul could have listened to Creflo. Obviously not. 
Well, Jesus's brother, James, hmm, what does he say? He says, do not complain, brethren, against one another so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. And so both of these passages are in the context of the church. The Lord is going to judge us all. That is why we need to be careful what we say. Be careful, right? Um, he also said something about wages of sin being death. That That's literally Romans 6, 23. So I, 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 Creflo dollars on this hyper grace theology where, I, you know, there are some people who just want to like, oh, that's Old Testament, that, you know, but even the things he said, I mean, are literally in the New Testament. So I, I, I don't. And he is a father in the new agreement. And in the old agreement, you serve him. But in the new agreement, he serves you. Okay, he said, so in the, old, the new covenant, he was a, he's a father. Well, I mean, he was a father in the old agreement too. So I don't know if he was trying to make some kind of distinction and parallel there. But the issue of, you know, in the old covenant, we served God. But in the new, co in the new covenant, God serves us. So you actually have this kind of role reversal. I would make an argument that us serving God has to do with us worshiping him. And so not in that case, if he wants to make this argument, well, no, I didn't mean like that. God serves us. OK, but no, this didn't change. We still serve God. You want proof? Colossians 324. And by the way, I could have gotten multiple verses with each of these points that he's throwing out here. Um, it says, knowing that from the Lord, you will receive the reward of their inheritance. It is the Lord Jesus Christ whom you serve. I mean, so there goes that theology right there about, hey, it's, you know, us serving God's kind of done away way. Now he's serving us. But th that makes it seem like we're God's now the butler waiting hand in hand on us. No, sir. No, no, no. See, this is a theology that is ultimately rooted in a bad. Uh, it, it was rooted in man centeredness where God's biggest delight is waking up, seeing you wake up in the morning. <laughs> right. He's, man, you got your folders. What else can I do for you? Rather than that being our duty, not to us, not to us, but to his name be the glory. Like, you know, this is this a totally uh, uh, theocentric view of life will change your perspective on even how you read the scriptures, right? You actually have a biblical view. But I found that bad. But don't worry. Do not worry. It is going to get worse. But wait, there's more. 21 through 22 then what we do sometimes if we don't want to resolve the difference between the old agreement and the new agreement the old testament and new testament the old covenant and new covenant we just want to just just mix them together and that's typical of the church today we're living by mixtures and the bible makes it real clear that we got to be careful about living by mixtures you know, you'll go around and you'll say, uh, well, I'm a sinner saved by grace. Well, which one are you? So, like, wait, there's more. Notice, notice even this. So the mixture is recognizing two realities. So he says, hey, which one are you? So you either got to choose you're a sinner or you're a saint. Now, our identity is of sainthood. That's our identity. But the reality is. We still sin. So in a technical sense, you're still a sinner. Right. Justified in Christ. So therefore, he's made us saints. I mean, it's, it's essentially it's Paul's confession in Romans chapter seven, where he says, wretched man that I am. Right. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And so what Creflo say, well, if, if, if you if you recognize that reality, then um, you're um, you're living in a mixture. <laughs> no. We live in the already not yet uh, context. We recognize, hey, right now we're still sinners. One day that will be done away with fully. That's not our identity of, of unrepentant sinners. Right. And so, I mean, the theology here is totally confused from from the Bible's teaching. See, I used to be a sinner. But now because of Jesus, I am saved by grace and I'm a saint. But you have a hard time saying that because you keep looking at your behavior. Well, yes, because sin, I mean, behavior lets you know if you're still sinning. <laughs>
I mean, he's like, well, don't don't look at your behavior. Just keep confessing that you're a saint. And then even when you ascend, say, hey, that's not me. I'm, I'm no longer a sinner. You know, I used to hold to this kind of theology before I was confused. I was confused on on these these both realities. Hey, we are both. Again, Christ has saved us. Amen. But the reality is that the presence of sin, I'm, I'm, I'm being sanctified. This is not sinless perfectionism. Right. That day is coming. Amen. Hallelujah. In the chat, somebody where we will be done with sin. Finally. And you got to understand that your identity it reigns better, greater than your behavior. See, if you believe that he made you righteous, then eventually you're going to start behaving righteous. It sounds like what he's arguing is, even though you see this reality, keep it in your mind, even if it doesn't match up, then just keep confessing it. And eventually it'll get right. I mean, I don't, I don't think the Bible teaches that at all. But you keep, you keep allowing your behavior to determine your identity. And if you behave bad, then you say, I'm a bad person. But you got to. I mean, I, I mean, it, it, it depends what you mean by that. That would have to be a little fleshed out. But I mean, that's kind of what Jesus said about the tree. right? Good trees produce good fruit. Bad trees produce bad fruit. Now, this doesn't mean good trees don't ever sin. So but uh, uh, ultimately what I'm getting at, a lot of this needs to be qualified and fleshed out a little more. By Creflo, but he knows his audience. And I will say in the sermon, he knew his audience. So he was giving them he was giving them a lot more extra than he usually preaches with, right? Because I mean he knows his audience. He knows these a bunch of uh heathen people in the pews that don't care nothing about it, right? They're in I mean they're in there listening to Jamal Bryant for a reason. And so he has to he has to give them what they want. Realize that the day you got born again, you've been made the righteousness of God. And now that you are the righteousness of God, honey, sometimes I don't care how you behave. You got to get bold enough to say, I'm still righteous. And the see, see, that's where it's kind of like, well, notice for, for Creflo, it doesn't matter how you behave, you know, um, how dare you? He, it doesn't matter how you behave. Unrepentant living with your girlfriend, shacking up for the last 15 years. Don't matter. Confess this. That's not what the Bible teaches at all. Rather, there needs to be true, genuine conversion. See, a lot of people don't have a, the a biblical theology of conversion where they go from darkness to light. Right now, again, I'm not preaching sinless perfection and not even close because I mean, remember, I'm the one re recognizing the reality of sin still presently. Now we're growing, we're conforming uh, to the image of Christ. But that sounded like antinomianism right there you believe that you're still righteous is the day you'll start doing righteous but you can't let your bad behavior uh, redefine your identity somebody shout I am the righteousness of God not in that church sir <laughs> not in that church we see how they deal with sin but it's going to get worse a little a little more dangerous because this the issue of salvation comes up now real quickly. Let's look at the requirements for salvation. How did it change? Now, this is interesting because we're going to look at Matthew, which was written uh, after the cross. But it speaks of what what the, the mindset was before the cross cross. Look at Matthew chapter 19 and verse 16. Matthew 19, 16. Man, I love the word. This stuff works. You hear me? Matthew 19 and verse 16 and 17. Check it out. Now, notice how they were, how the instructions went to someone that wanted to get to heaven before the cross. Notice what he is about to teach that Jesus was actually teaching. Well, I, th this blow me off. I couldn't actually believe he was actually teaching this. Verse 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, good master. What good thing, watch this, shall I do that I may have eternal life? See, he's still looking to perform so he can earn eternal life. And, 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 and Jesus was trying to help him, but he didn't listen. He says, and he said unto him, why calleth me good? There's none good but one, that is God. He said, however, if thou, now that's a pattern of the old covenant, there it is. If thou will enter into life, Keep the commandments. So he says, okay, uh, you're still operating 
uh, uh, by the old agreement. All right, according to the old agreement, if you want to have eternal life, keep the commandments. No, 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 no. What? Bro, what are you talking about? Bro? Boy, ain't no way, boy. Boy, ain't no way, boy. If you listen to what Creflo was saying, he's actually arguing Jesus is preaching work salvation because in the old covenant, that's how it was. Um, how dare you? I do not believe that's what Jesus is doing in this passage. What Jesus is actually exposing to this man is that he is not good, uh, that this man is not good. And he starts with the law. He starts with the law to expose, expose him. Right. Because remember what the man said. Hey, I've kept all the all these things I've kept. Right. What do I still lack? This man is a self-righteous person. So what does Jesus do? He exposes his self-righteousness. <laughs> That's why he brings the law to bear upon him, right? That's why Jesus says, hey, look, sell all these things. And what does the man do? He walks away sad. This man, though he claimed to kept the law perfectly, Jesus exposed on the first law. You don't because you have another God before me. You put something before me and it was your possessions. And so Jesus isn't saying, OK. Let me tell you how to get heaven. You, you could be saved by doing all this. Jesus is actually making a more comprehensive argument in the context of all this. Um, <laughs> I mean, we're going to get into a passage real quick because he's going to return back to this idea of uh, salvation. But I just thought that was very bad. But let's let's go to a few other things before we get to, before we return back to this idea of salvation in the old covenant versus new covenant. Well, I ought to go to heaven because I did this, I did that, and I did this, and I did that, and I did that, and I did that. No, baby, that's not how you get into heaven. Please, I'm going to say something so radical, praise the Lord, but I'm, I'm going back to... Whenever a preacher says that, you already know they're about to say something so unbiblical. Buckle up. ...the South, but I'm, I'm going to say something so radical right now. People don't go to hell because of their behavior. If anybody in here goes to hell because of your behavior, then everybody in here is going to hell because of your behavior. No, 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 no. People go to hell because they reject Jesus. They reject the gift. They reject everything that he did. To, for you to think that sin is greater than God's grace, you are sadly mistaken. When sin arounds, grace does much more abound. And it might not look too good right now, but keep believing that God that's on the inside of you. He knows how to change your desires. He knows how to transform you. He knows how to bring you out of the mess you've been stuck in for the last years of your life. So... <laughs> What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? I'm tired of so, so he says that people don't go to hell for sin. They go to hell for rejecting Jesus. Well, that would be a shock to many people in the Bible who are, or people in hell. <laughs> you know, uh, but listen to this passage. First Corinthians chapter six, nine through 11 says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Uh, unrighteous. What do you mean unrighteous? That's a behavior issue. And Paul qualifies that. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. My friend, any sin will bring you to hell. And so it's not the fact that, hey, uh, we're sinning a little less. That's why we make it versus these people. It's our sin has been forgiven because we have actually come to Jesus Christ. We've had true conversion. See, Creflo doesn't understand conversion. See, he thinks conversion is just you accept something as true and you live your life and eventually you will get it right. No, sir. Conversion categorically changes our identity, our position and our lifestyle. See, it's not just accepting some mere facts. Again, these works aren't uh, contributive to our justification. Rather, they're fruits of true justification. Again, um, 
I mean, that's what verse 11 says. Such were, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the, and by the spirit of our God. See, justif true justification always result in sanctification, right? Um, boy, that's bad. Uh, an issue that, well, let's get into this one. Uh, I, I'd be curious to see what you guys think about this topic. This is difficult to talk about because we've put so much stock in your behavior and not believing that Jesus can change your behavior. And so through fear and condemnation and shame, we try to shame people and guilt people into doing right. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Little girl, go out and get pregnant. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You're going to hell by 12 o'clock. Well, you going with her. Now, yeah, he's trying to be humorous, bring this up, because you, you have a lot of adulterous people in this church, right? I mean, even the pastor. But let me just say this. Sin brings shame. Now, there's no condemnation in Jesus Christ. Don't hear that, please. But when you sin, there should be some guilt. Second Corinthians 17 speaks of godly grief producing a repentance. So there's going to be some grief when you sin. There's going to be some conviction, some shamefulness. Yes, that shall happen. But again, there's no condemnation in Christ. But again, you know, it, it almost sounds like when you sin, yeah, you do all the things God hates. You shouldn't even feel bad about that. I mean, this guy is just hyper grace. I mean, don't feel bad about sin. Matter of fact, no sin. I mean, it's this is an unbiblical view of grace because the grace I read in Scripture actually results in a change. Uh, Titus 3 speaks about that. Um, actually, Titus 2. Because we don't trust that God knows what he's doing. See, he says some water, some plant, but he gives the increase. Now, all of a sudden, you think you're the one giving the increase. No, I just believe what the Bible says about sin. So it has nothing to do with me giving the increase. I mean... I, see, this This is a big old... Do you want to build a... Straw man! A lot of straw man going on in this sermon. A lot of straw man. But let's get to this next one. This is, I think, one of the more important issues. I want to spend a little more time fleshing out. So let's check this out. But after the cross, you're blessed not necessarily because of your acts, but because we are his redeemed and we are blessed because of Jesus. We went over that. Before the cross, we were justified by works. No, 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 no. Boy, ain't no way, boy. Boy, ain't no way, boy. Um, how dare you? No, no, sir. And I know this is a common belief. When I was a young convert, I was taught it, and therefore I believed it. But the Bible does not teach what he just said. Matter of fact, the Bible actually teaches in total opposition. Let me share my screen with you just so we can get into the into the text here. And just to demonstrate what I'm saying is true, that the Bible nowhere teaches that in the old covenant, they were justified by works. Uh, matter of fact, one of the clearest examples that the New Testament authors use to demonstrate salvation by grace is the is the Old Testament authors themselves. Look at Romans four, if you will, with me. Notice what it says. It says, what then was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to, to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Notice the very point that Creflo is making is contradicted by the Apostle Paul. For what does the scripture say? Notice, notice this. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. That's, that's not works based, sir. That's not that's not works. Abraham is set up as the model by Paul to demonstrate salvation is not by law. Now, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as a due. And to the one who does not works, you want salvation? Don't work for it. Put in the chat, don't work for it, right? To the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Notice this, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. See, even David is used in this manner. It has never been by law, law, 
I'm going to go a little further with another passage, but let me continue. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. You want to be the blessed man that David speaks of? Don't work for it. Come to Christ. Trust in his perfect work. Trust in his perfect works. Not in what we've done. We could never pay God. We can never repay God in that manner. And so I was blown away when he said that. Um, but but let me just even go a little further. Look at Galatians chapter three, five through 14. Let's read this glorious passage together. It says, does he who supply the spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Now, there's obvious one answer. <laughs> it's by faith. But notice he proves it and establishes it. Further, again, with Abraham, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. See, why can we be called sons of Abraham? Even though we're not, you know, physical Jews or some of you, right? Or many of us, why we're not uh, physical Jews is because Abraham is the model of the faith. I mean, he's even called the father of the faith. Right. And so Abraham is set up as this paradigm of the prototypical Christian. <laughs> I love that. Look at verse eight. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. See, now that even language right there will even mess with your theology. Right. That'll mess up your theology for many. Well, hey, how, how could the gospel be preached to the Old Testament if Christ hasn't come? <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a little taste of what that means. But see, the gospel was preached in the Old Testament through through types and shadows. Right. The gospel was was a was hidden through types and shadows, but now has been revealed in Christ. Can I get an amen in that? Can I get an amen to that? Right. The gospel was hidden in the the typology of of uh animal sacrifice that a lamb would be that which takes away the sins of the world behold <laughs> what does john say the lamb who takes away the sin of the world so many typologies when you dive in the old testament to see these realities that the gospel was all over it the gospel is not a new testament invention ultimately is what i'm getting at this is why they shouldn't have been surprised when jesus came on declaring these things it actually shows how blinded they were. So we don't have we don't have a new thing in the sense of never heard before in the New Testament. Please don't think there's just this super radical change. Radical. We're like, whoa, this is just completely different. That's not what that passage is speaking about. Let's go on. It says for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. Listen to this. And notice what he's what he cites. To demonstrate that for it is written and he, he cites an Old Testament passage. Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of law and do them. So how could it be by law when it, you know, this passage existed in the old covenant? They knew it wasn't by law keeping. Now it is evident to the one who does. So sorry. Now it is evident that no one is justified by before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. Guess what? An Old Testament passage. An Old Testament passage. The righteous shall live by faith. Hmm. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For his written curse, it is everyone who was hanged on a tree. So that is in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith not by law sir so i don't know what creflo is talking about i don't know what bible he's reading but it was never by law keeping that a man was justified i think i'd prove that in just those passages we can go through more but after the cross we're justified by faith before the cross god was a judge after the cross he was a father Be well we've already demonstrated in the New Testament, he's still a judge. And then in the Old Testament, he was a father. I mean, I mean, I don't know what Bible this guy is reading. For the cross, there was no mediator. They referred to a mediator in Job as a daysman, which is a mediator. 
And Job said in Job 9, 32, 33, there is no daysman. Before the cross, there was no mediator between God and man. But after the cross, Jesus is our mediator. Well, so how were they forgiven in the Old Testament then? I would say they were through the shadows and types. The, the, the mediator was hidden. But they still were forgiven. Now, I, I don't know what he believes about that. Before the cross, God was distant and unapproachable to the people. Exodus 19 said, don't even come near that mountain or you're going to die. But after the cross, we have been brought near to God. What did the psalmist say? The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. I, I, I really struggle with, with this sermon because it's like he says something outlandish. It's like, man, you're probably thinking of verses in your head like you're like, wait, what? Huh? What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? This is bad. According to Ephesians chapter 2, before the cross, righteousness was demanded of a sinful and fallen man. But after the cross, righteousness is a free gift given to everyone in Christ Jesus. Before the cross, Adam's sin meant condemnation for all men. But after the cross, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, again, I'm not going to deal with everything he brought up, but the point where he's making is these extreme radical changes. Even the gospel changed from old covenant to new covenant. I mean, how would the old covenant gospel be obey God for salvation, be actual good news? It, it's just strange. But don't worry. You know, you got to end a sermon. You you, you got to end a sermon with something with the J.G. Wentworth gospel. And I need cash now. Call J.G. Wentworth. 877-CASH-NOW. Right. Get your hands off me! Wrong one. I got bread in my pocket. 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 Go on and put a bread in the chat, right? Because you know he got to get into it, right? Let's hear how he's going to finagle them after that sermon. But you got to you got to renew your mind. You got to renew your mind from dog. All preachers want is your money. That is a devilish slogan, because in actuality, all Walmart want is your money. All Kroger's want is your money. Well, the church ain't a business. The, cur the church ain't a grocery store. So why are you comparing the church to Kroger and Walmart? Who, who yes, they want your money. Yes, of course, they want you shopping there. The church ain't a shopping shopping mark, mark right? Where oh yeah, you know you can pick whatever you like. And here, here's now here's here's an exchange. See, see this ain't nothing but no gaslight. Or I'm thinking that's some type of arsonist. Oh, don't worry, he got some more. But the only reason the devil put that in there is to stick something in your head to get you stuck in this area where you don't want to give and then hold up your material prosperity because you're thinking that everybody's always after my money. Well, you just said, you just compare the church to a marketplace, which is after your money. But notice, he, you know, you're going to hold up your material prosperity. You want that? I got bread in my pocket. I know y'all like that. Put the bread in the chat then if you like it. Yeah, so again, prosperity gospel one-on-one -on -one being taught right here. And so I tell people in my church, if you don't want to give, please don't. Do us both a favor. Keep that $2 and go down McDonald's and get you a happy meal so you can be happy. Gaslight. I'm thinking that's some type of arson. How dare you? Yeah, so he's got to gaslight him, right? His, his poor people in his, in his church, right? They can only give $2. Like they're, 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 they're doing the best they can to even give those $2 trying to be generous. And he's up there berating them. You know what I mean? I'm tired of your church. Oh, don't worry. He got some more gaslight. <laughs> well, how do you think heaven feels? You struggle to write that. And, and you think just because you offered it, it, it was accepted. What's the motive? What's moving you to do what you're doing? And it can't always be, I want to give so I can get some material. That'll happen, but it's got to be deeper than that. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it's going to happen. But you got to give because I'm telling you to give. I mean, you tell them, hey, you, 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 all, you guys always preach. Um, 
you know, give and you will get. And then when people do that for the reason, you're like, hold on, that can't be the motive. Yeah. See, now, when you just tell people to freely give, you know, not the whole 10 percent thing or some people do even more than that. You know, they demand this. Um, You get people money motivated rather than say, hey, look, man, I want to give because I want to help the needs of the saints. One, I want to honor God. You don't hear a lot of that in these teachings, you know. You'll hear something like this. And I need cash now. Call J.G. Wentworth. 877 cash now. But yeah, of course that sermon was going to be bad. It was in Jamal Bryant's church. You no, know, we have looked at many of his sermons and you'll always get some. Like a bad sermon. Heresies there. You'll always get some heresy. Tell me what you guys think in the chat. Do you agree with what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, the gospel's good news. And it is been since the fall of Abraham, or sorry, Abraham, (laughs) the fall of Adam, right? Where you actually have the Genesis 15, the proto-evangelium, the the gospel uh, right after uh, Adam sinned, where he was clothed, he was clothed, right? Um, That demonstrates the gospel very early on. And so hopefully you guys like this video to the next time. Grace and peace. Yo, grace and peace. Thank you for watching another episode of All Things Theology. If you enjoyed what you heard today, go on and give me a like. Subscribe to the channel. Hit that notification bell. I promise to give you weekly lives, videos, interactions, exposing false teachers, sharing with you, the viewer, my theological beliefs, things about the culture and the Bible. So if you're here for that, come on and join us. Also, if you would like to support this channel financially, you can do so by becoming a Patreon member or a YouTube member. Links are in the description below. You can see content before it drops. You can also have Q&A sessions with also other Patreon members, YouTube members as well. So if you would like that, hit the description link in below.